Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Maria, and I'm your cabin crew today. On behalf of the captain, welcome on board this flight to Bangladesh. The flight time today is going to be 18 minutes. Please take a few moments now to locate your emergency exits. I came to Dubai in 2003 to work as a cabin crew. I was planning to stay here one year, two years. But that never happened because that flight, that duty flight to Bangladesh, it changed my life and the life of hundreds of children. Working for the first time in the slums, I understood the definition of the word slum. All I could see, it was so much potential going to waste. I wanted to do something. In the beginning, people thought I was crazy. I couldn't possibly make any change in the slums of Dhaka. It was just impossible. We spoke different languages. We had different religions, different backgrounds. Different, different, different. But the way I see things is that we are all the same when we come to this planet. The only thing that sets us apart it's only the opportunities that became available to us. And we don't have any control over that. Let me put this in perspective for you. When I was two years old, my mother had no job. This is when she met Christina, a poor refugee lady from Angola, a widow. She had six kids, and she worked as a cleaner to feed them. Yet, when Christina met my mother, she didn't hesitate in volunteering to look after me until my mother found a job. What Christina didn't know at the time was, my mother had Alzheimer's and she will never come back to pick me up. So, Christina became my mother. Her motto was, who feeds six, will feed seven. And there was I, this tiny little white child living with Christina in a very humble home with her children. And the strange thing is, I never saw the color, neither I felt or understood how poor we were. It's only now when sometimes I look back and I try to compare it, it might seem that way. But in my heart, I had the best years of my life with Christina. And she was absolutely right. Who feeds six, feeds seven. Look at my curves. <laughs> Christina had to fight for many years to keep me with her. First with the social services, then with the government. In fact, with anyone who tried to take me away from her. You have to understand that 30 years ago, it was just inconceivable, the idea of a black woman to adopt a white child. Fast forward 30 years, and Barack Obama is the president of America. So who knows? Who really knows what can happen in another 30 years? Maybe a child of the slums will find a cure for cancer. Maybe she will become the president of Bangladesh. Maybe they will build bigger towers. Maybe they will find solutions for the main problems we are facing at the moment. So on that note, I started to go to Dhaka on my days off. My job it was a great platform to take essential needs to Dhaka. The list it was long, but we started small. I had no shame in asking anyone for help. I asked pilots, cabin crew, friends, passengers, family, anyone really. And just with the word of mouth, I got the ball rolling. The response was just overwhelming. My house soon started to look like a warehouse. Dubai flea markets, they started in my home. Oh yes, I am sure that seven years ago there was not this concept in Dubai. 
with the funds we were raising from the flea markets, we established our first school for 39 children two months later after my visit to Dhaka. Soon the 39 children became 98, then 145, then 200, and because of the motto of Christina, who feeds six, feeds seven, don't ask me how we got to 600 kids. We then we established a nursery, a preschool, a sewing school, a beauty school, a canteen, library. And because I was bringing the European standards to a third world country to avoid conflict, we soon had to start to help the local community. So we started by renovating their own schools, sharing our supplies, started to establish water wells, build their roads, give them access to our vaccination programs, providing them with the birth certificates, giving them access to our adult training centers. Three years later, he hit me. I actually realized that the project was just being a band aid. The project was only addressing to the signs and the symptoms of poverty. I had to find a way to solve the problem at the root. Now you're gonna ask me, why don't they do it themselves? Do, does, do I need to go to their country and help them? Can't they find a solution for their own problems? Listen to this. Have you ever been to the circus? Have you ever seen the elephants in there? When, a baby is a, when the elephant is a baby, we attach him to a chain on his feet so he doesn't escape. While the elephant is a baby, he tries and he tries and he tries in vain to break that chain. And he can't break that chain because the chain is stronger than him. When the elephant grows up and is an adult, he will stop trying, because he tried so many times and he couldn't break that chain. And this is the same mentality of the slum dwellers in Bangladesh. Just think about it. The lack of role models or the lack of hope reduces them to a robotic state where they live for today, no planning for tomorrow. It's very hard to change a slum when everything around you is a slum 24-7. I knew I could not let my kids grow that way and be happy about it. That was not the vision I had for them. I knew in order to help the children, I had to help their parents. I had to try to change the mentality and see that they too could accomplish greater things. Even though we managed to build roads and first set centers and dental centers there, there was one thing that I was not gonna be able to change. And it was the way that their society was divided in castes. So that made it difficult to empower the parents. So I came to Dubai, the land of the opportunities. I started to target hotels, airlines, trying to find job employment for the fathers of the kids. One year later, finally, Nurul Islam was the first one to break that cycle. Emirates Airlines offered him a job as an office boy. Nurul is soon became such a hero, such a role model, such an inspiration to the rest, that slowly, slowly we started to employ one by one. In last year we employed nine more. And one month ago I had a meeting with a company that is willing to employ 150 if I manage to shape them here in the bar. Today we have here fathers, mothers, and we all have one thing in common. We all want the best for our children. We all want the best education, the best opportunities. We all want to see them going to college. We all want to see them to become the next leaders. We all want to see them to become the doctors, the nurses, the engineers of tomorrow. Me too. I had that dream. I had a dream of, of creating an army 
of people that they will rebrand the slums of tomorrow. So in August 2010, I brought our top five students to educate them here in Dubai. They, were, they are aged 12 to 14. I wanted to show them, bringing them here to Dubai, I wanted to show them and prove to them that here you can dream as big as you want. You can aspire anything you want and your future is only in your hands. Of course, when we undertook this project, we had zero rates of success. But we had an amazing team of volunteers that they were, they shared the same vision and they were as stubborn as I was to make that dream come true. Initially, we faced many challenges here, many prejudices. 99% of the time we were asked, what is the purpose? Why bringing them here? Can't you educate them in Dubai? It was so frustrating. We got a lucky break. Talim came forward and he offered the kids a school place in their school. Bringing them here to Dubai, and Talim came forward and offered them a school place in their school. The UAE Minister of Education provided them with a, school, with a student's visa and host families, just like Christina. They opened their homes and their heart to the project. Bringing them to Dubai, finding them schools, and finding them host families, it was huge. But that was just the beginning. I still had to secure six years, I still had to secure six years of funds for their education. And that amount of money, it was not gonna come from flea markets. Also, in the back of my head, I had a huge fear. What if something happened to me? Christina died when I was 12 years old, and I was never able to finish my studies. So every night I went to bed and I wondered, if something happens to me, would they go back to the slums? Would all our efforts up to that point will just vanish? I could not take that chance. So I decided I would set up a trust fund to secure their future. And with the rationality that only a mother lion has towards her child, her baby lions, I decided to raise funds and create awareness, I would go to the North Pole. Yes, you have heard correctly, the North Pole. Did I think that through? Of course not. Was I the best person to attempt such a physical challenge? <laughs> Definitely not. Let me tell you, up to that point, my daily exercise was walking from first class to economy class, selling duty free. Would you like to buy duty free? Would you like to buy duty free? Hardly a North Pole preparation, don't you think? But I had something to my advantage. I had motivation. And that motivation had five names. Milan, Sujan, Taslim, Bilkish, and Shuli. Milan, now he was so inspired by Burj Khalifa, he wanted to open, he wanted to become an engineer and build a taller one in the slums of Dhaka. Sujon wanted to become a cardiologist and set up a hospital in his village. Taslim, so overwhelmed by choices, he still doesn't know what he wants to do. Bilkish, she wanted to become a lawyer and she wants to solve all the problems of the world. And Shuli, so inspired by Sheikh Zayed, she wanted now to become the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. So you understand my responsibility now, don't you? North Poly was an option. Even knowing that I was putting myself under danger, failure, it was just not an option. 
I was hoping to hit the media with a success story of raising funds. But reality is that what he seemed the impossible mission to me, he was treated by everyone like a walk in a park. I completely underestimated that the world saturated with news. Going to the North Pole, it wasn't such a big deal after all. I could spend days and days talking to you about the North Pole experience, but for me, going to reaching the North Pole, it was just a means to see my kids through education. And I went to the North Pole, and I came back, all my fingers intact, but no funds. Miracles, miracles do happen. Six weeks later, after giving a speech at Jam School, all the children, they were offered a full scholarship there. What a relief, isn't it? My mission is still not done. I still have to secure their funds to see them through college. Meanwhile, in Dhaka, our kids, they are no longer kids. They are growing into young adults. The first ones that they joined the project seven years ago at the age of 12, they are now coming to Dubai to be full-time employees. And I promise you I'm not doing speeches for Emirates Airlines, but Emirates Airlines employed them. People, they ask me now, how do you feel it for seeing your kids finally breaking the cycle of poverty finally having an opportunity to build their lives. Do you really want to know how I feel? Do you? I feel like I had a multiple pregnancy for seven years, three years in labor, and finally that butterfly comes out with a chance of life. I am now a regular in marathons, walkathons, Climbing, my, climbing mountains, any physical challenge for me is just a means to raise funds and awareness for our project. Trust me, it rarely feels like a walk in the park. Three months ago, after delivering a speech, I met Rosa. Rosa decided, Rosa was a housewife, mother of three children, who decided then that she was gonna walk the seven marathons in seven days across the seven Emirates. I will be joining her, and I hope that you too will join us on that challenge. When I look at poverty, I see butterflies. When I look at poverty, I only see potential. And I hope you too, when you are given an opportunity to make a change in someone's life, you remember, humans, they are just like elephants, with only one exception. You can choose to not have any limitations or boundaries. Christina, a poor refugee woman from Angola, who struggled to feed six of her own children, she didn't hesitate to open their, her home and her heart to me. And here I am today, Standing has her legacy. So ladies and gentlemen, no more excuses to turn a blind eye. My legacy, they are there. And I can assure you, not very far from now, they will be here talking. How did they get to be there?